A very good evening aspirants. I welcome you all to the daily Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar Ace Academy. Today I am going to cover 8 different news articles from the Hindu newspaper dated 29th of December 2022. Displayed here are list of news articles that we are going to discuss today. Now without any delay let us get into the first news article discussion. Now look at this news article here. It talks about the Nilgiri Thar. See yesterday the Tamil Nadu state government has launched an initiative for the conservation of endangered Nilgiri Thar. See this conservation program is to be implemented for a period of 5 years that is from 2022 to 2027. And this is the crux of the news article given here. Now in this context let us learn about Nilgiri Thar from prelims perspective. See Nilgiri Thar is considered as a pride of Western Ghats because Nilgiri Thar is endemic species of Western Ghats. Know that the Nilgiri Thar is the only mountain hoofed mammal in southern India amongst the 12 species present in India. It is found in the tropical mountains of southern India that is none other than Western Ghats. And note one fact here Nilgiri Thar is the state animal of Tamil Nadu. This is a brief about Nilgiri Thar. Now talking about its conservation status, see Nilgiri Thar is listed as endangered in the IUCN red list of threatened species. It is also protected under Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act 1972. It is about conservation. Now coming to its habitat, see it is found in open mountain grassland habitats at elevations from 1200 to 2600 meter of the southern western guards. Currently the Nilgiri Thar distribution is along a narrow stretch of 400 kilometers in the western guards. And this is between Nilgiris in the north and Kanyakumar hills in the south of the region. Here you should also know that the Ervikulam National Park in Anaimalai hills of Kerala is home to the largest population of Nilgiri Thar. And this is about habitat. Now talking about the threats faced by Nilgiri Thar, see the Nilgiri Thar faces multiple threats from both natural and man-made factors. As we know habitat loss due to deforestation is shrinking their area of habitation. Then there is competition with domestic livestock, then hydroelectric projects in Nilgiri Thar habitat and monoculture plantations. See these are all some of the other threats faced by Nilgiri Thar. And the animal is also occasionally hunted for its meat and skin. This is about the threats. Now coming to the news article, this news article mentions that there are challenges in the conservation of Nilgiri Thars. The challenges are due to highly fragmented populations of Nilgiri Thar, then invasion of exotic species in the habitat, then forest fires, then over exploitation of forest resources and lack of ecological data and understanding. See these are all some of the challenges in the conservation of Nilgiri Thar. So the conservation program by the government of Tamil Nadu will going to focus on understanding the species so that it could be very useful for their conservation. And that's all regarding this news article. In this news article we saw about Nilgiri Thar, its conservation status, then habitat, then some of the threats faced by Nilgiri Thar and finally about some of the challenges in the conservation of Nilgiri Thars. See this topic is very important from the prelims perspective. So make note of each and every points that we discussed. Now with these key points let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now look at this text and context article here. In this article the author discusses about the need for caste census. Various points highlighting the advantages of caste census are provided in this article. The opinion of the author of the editorial is that not conducting caste census will only benefit the privileged or the elite class. And this is the essence of the article given here. In our discussion today, we will see what is caste census, then what is the need for caste census and finally we will see some issues with the caste census. In the need for caste census part, we will see the various points highlighted in the article. This is the plan. But before we start, I want to say that this discussion is very useful for your mains examination because the thing that we are about to discuss has relevance in both GS paper 1 and GS paper 2. In GS paper 1 we have social empowerment, communalism, regionalism and secularism part where they might ask questions about the role of caste census in inciting communalism. In GS paper 2 we have the government policies and interventions for development in various sectors and issues arising out of their design and implementation where they might ask questions about the relevance of caste census for upward social mobility. So this discussion is very important. Listen very carefully and make use of it. Let's first see a little bit of background. 
seen 2011 the socio economic and caste census was conducted in india this was the second time the socio economic and caste census was conducted in india the first census was conducted in 1931 and the 2011 socio economic and caste census focuses on two things one the economic status of an individual and the individual's particular caste by correlating this both the socio economic and caste census tried to study the economic inequality between the castes the socio economic and caste census was mainly conducted to identify the beneficiaries of government support although the 2011 census data was made available for the government to identify the potential beneficiaries the government did not disclose the raw caste data on other backward class collected during socio economic and caste census 2011 see the caste data in the census that is mainly the data about the obcs has been lying dormant with the ministry of social justice and empowerment the government of india said due to flaws in the caste data it will not be made available to the public to explain the flaws in the 2011 census the government of india stated these examples in maharashtra for instance the existing sc st and obc categories as per government records are only 494 But the 2011 caste census yielded 4 lakh 28,677 castes, and at the national level, according to the 1931 socio-economic and caste census, there were a total of 4,147 castes. But the 2011 caste census showed that the presence of 46 lakh different castes in India. Finally, of all the castes enumerated in 2011 census, 99 percentage had a population of less than 100 persons. the government citing these flaws termed the 2011 caste census is unreliable and did not publish the caste data to the public now you may have a question what is the need for socio economic and caste census when we already conduct the caste census every 10 years right and do we collect caste data as a part of normal census let me explain as part of the normal census exercise we collect caste data regarding scs and sts only the caste data regarding obcs and upper castes are not covered under normal census exercise the normal census only provides a picture of the indian population and it is the socio economic and caste census that helps in identifying the beneficiaries of state support and also helps us to understand india's graded caste hierarchy due to this only many people demanded the collection of all caste data as a part of 2021 census for example in 2021 the maharashtra government demanded the collection of data on the backward class of citizens of rural india during the enumeration of 2021 census but the union government said that collection of caste data except the collection of data on scs and sts which is done traditionally was unfeasible and administratively difficult and cumbersome and this is the status so far regarding caste census now with this background let's see the need for caste census first is data driven decision making see the data from caste based census will help the government rationalize the reservation policy how currently the caste based reservation that we currently provide is based on the caste census carried out in 1931 and population has undergone a lot of change after 1931 so conducting a caste based census will provide the government with the necessary information and using this information the government can rationalize the reservation policy in our country this prevents certain communities from enjoying the lion share of government's reservation policy then data from the caste based census can also be used by the government to form effective government policy for example after conducting a caste based census the government finds that a particular area has people belonging to a particular caste and they face a certain kind of problem to address this problem the government can evolve localized plans like this the caste based census can help the government evolve data driven localized plans this is about the first need that is data driven decision making now coming to the second need it is understanding india's caste hierarchy and establishing a just society according to various scholars formal blindness or not acknowledging the presence of caste in a casteist society then this might result in a denial of caste based privileges that some caste continue to experience in our society so when we ignore the presence of caste the elite castes will continue to get all the opportunities offered by the government according to various scholars in order to abolish caste it is essential to first abolish caste derived privileges 
in order to abolish caste derived privileges the government must first identify castes and their socio economic status using the caste based census the government can identify whether a particular caste is privileged or deprived after this only the government can take measures to reduce the privileges enjoyed by a particular caste and take steps to uplift the castes that are deprived see these are all some of the points that necessitates the need for caste based census now let's see the issues with caste based census firstly some people believe that caste census will further entrench caste identities this will stand against the way of national building as caste identities might lead to infighting among our citizens the author of the editorial counter this claim by saying that only a full caste wise census will helps us to understand privileges some castes continue to enjoy the author believes although in the short term caste based census might create some friction in the long term caste based census will be beneficial then the second issue with the caste based census is regarding the misuse of the caste data the political parties might use the caste based data to involve in vote bank politics the author of the editorial places a counter to this point also he says that even now political parties map the caste and religious composition of neighborhoods cities and villages to mobilize votes for example in tamil nadu during elections in some constituencies the candidates nominated by all the political parties will belong to a particular caste or religion so even without the caste census all the political parties use caste to mobilize votes so according to the author citing this as a reason to not conduct caste based census is correct the author says that once caste census is collected and made available to the public it removes the power that the political parties hold over the public because then the public will clearly understand the motive behind every move of the political parties then the last issue cited by the government regarding caste census is it is cumbersome and logically difficult to conduct here the author says that most people in the upper bureaucracy and even the caste department are filled with people of the elite caste once the caste based census is completed it is the people of the elite caste who will lose their privilege so according to the author the bureaucrats are resisting the caste census process to continue enjoying their privilege and to prevent caste census from happening they cite vague reasons like the process is difficult and cumbersome see these are all some of the issues with caste based census and the counter offered to it by the author finally the author suggests that moving forward when the caste census is conducted in the future the entire operation might be under the oversight of anti caste organizations and public intellectuals who have dedicated their life fighting oppression in our country finally i am ending this discussion with a quote to the privileged equality feels like oppression and that's all regarding this news article discussion this discussion we saw about what is caste based census then we saw in brief about the socio economic and caste census of 2011 then we saw about the need for caste census and finally we saw about some of the issues with the caste based census as i told earlier this topic is very important for your mains exam so make note of each and every points that we discussed in this article now with these key points in mind let's move on to the next news article discussion now look at this text and context article here it says that jan vishwas bill 2022 was tabled by the union government last week see the objective of the bill is to decriminalize 183 offenses across 42 legislations and to enhance the ease of living and doing business in india this bill is an attempt to reverse the trend of over criminalization and this is the crux of the news article given here now in this context let us see the important provisions of the bill and also its shortcomings but before that the syllabus relevant to this article is given here kindly go through it first of all what is the need for this bill see we saw that the bill's main objective is to reverse the trend of over criminalization it means that over criminalization is serving as a hindrance to ease of living and doing business in india now first of all you should understand what is over criminalization see it is nothing but the over use or misuse of criminal law to address societal problems which could be addressed more effectively through the civil legal system or other institutions so as per the article india is now seeing the trend of over criminalization see the government is using criminal law as a political tool and this act of enacting criminal law has become a medium for the government to show a strong image and this trend of over criminalization has some consequences the first consequence is the pending of cases see as per the national judicial data grid out of the 4.3 crore 
pending cases, nearly 3.2 crore cases are related to criminal proceedings. So, the pending of criminal cases have a direct relation to the number of criminal laws. Then, second consequences is the increase in prison population. As per the National Crime Records Bureau's prison statistics of 2021, a total of 5.54 lakh prisoners were confined in prisons against a capacity of 4.25 lakh. See, these two consequences necessitated the Jan Vishwas Bill 2022. This bill aims to decriminalize offense in many legislations. Now, with this understanding, let's move on to see the important provisions of the bill. See, the scope of the bill is very large. It includes amendments to 42 legislations. It is not necessary for us to see all those amendments and it is also impossible to remember them all. So, I will give you an idea about what the bill is. See, the first provision is regarding decriminalizing certain offenses. The Jan Viswas bill either omits or replaces penal provisions in certain legislations with monetary penalty. Some of the important legislations which are to be amended include Air Act, then Environment Protection Act, Forest Act, Drugs and Cosmetics Act, Cinematograph Act, Patents Act, then Trademarks Act and Information Technology Act, etc. Remember, as I already said, 42 legislations are to be amended as per the bill. Here, I have mentioned some important legislations alone. Now, I will give you an example for the first provision that is regarding decriminalizing certain offenses. See, under the Information Technology Act 2000, disclosing personal information is punishable with imprisonment of up to 3 years or a fine of up to 5 lakh rupees or both. But the Jan Viswas bill replaces this with a penalty of up to 25 lakh rupees. Now you understand how the bill is decriminalizing the offences. Then the second provision is revision of fines and penalties. See the bill increases the fines and penalties for various offences in the specified acts. And these fines and penalties will be increased by 10% of the minimum amount every 3 years after the bill becomes an act. Then the third provision is the appointment of adjudicating officers. As per the bill, the central government may appoint one or more adjudicating officers for the purpose of determining penalties. And these adjudicating officers may summon individuals for evidence and they can conduct inquiries into violations of four acts. These acts include Agricultural Produce, Grading and Marketing Act 1937, then Air Prevention and Control of Pollution Act 1981, then Environment Protection Act 1986 and Public Liability Insurance Act 1991. This is about the third provision. And the next important provision is the appellate mechanisms. See, the bill specifies the appellate mechanisms for any person aggrieved by the order passed by an adjudicating officer. For example, in the case of Environment Protection Act 1986, appeals may be filed with National Green Tribunal within 60 days from the order. And these are the important provisions of Jan Vishwas Bill 2022. See, everything has its own advantages and disadvantages, right? So, this bill also has some shortcomings. Now, let us see what they are. Firstly, the author is quoting the report of Observer Research Foundation. The report is titled as Jailed for Doing Business. This report found that there are more than 26,134 imprisonment classes in a total of 843 economic legislations in India. So, compared to this, the number of offenses deregulated under the bill is significantly less. See, the author is saying that if the bill aims to decriminalize the legislations, then it should cover all. This is the first shortcoming. Secondly, the author is saying that the regulatory offenses that are to be decriminalized should be viewed from the point of criminal justice system also. This means that it should not affect the justice provided to the aggrieved party. So, according to the author, the shortcoming here is that the bill views offenses only from the point of view of ease of doing business. Lastly, the author is saying that the bill mainly concentrates on limiting decriminalization to regulatory domains. But the author is saying that decriminalization should be extended to several other penal offenses such as sedition, then offenses under unlawful activities prevention acts, etc. See, these are the some of the shortcomings. See, the bill is aimed to ensure that imprisonment is replaced with fines for as many offenses as possible, but the success of the bill is questionable. Now, we have to wait and see how the bill turns out. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about Jan Vishwas Bill 2022. Then what is the need for such bill? Then some of the important provisions in the bill. And finally, some of the shortcomings in the bill. See, this topic is very important in the aspect of mains. So make note of each and every points that we discussed in this article. And with these key points in mind, let's move on to the next news article discussion. 
Now have a look at this news article. This news article says that Vigilance Commissioner Praveen Kumar Srivastava has been appointed as the Acting Central Vigilance Commissioner. Now in this context, let us revise about Central Vigilance Commission. See, Central Vigilance Commission was established in February 1964 based on the recommendations of Sandhanam Committee on Prevention of Corruption. Central Vigilance Commission consists of a Central Vigilance Commissioner and two Vigilance Commissioners. Initially, it was constituted by a resolution and it gained statutory status in the year 1998 through an ordinance. However, at present, it is a statutory body established under the Central Vigilance Commission Act of 2003. Now, why was this organization established? See, it was established to address corruption in the country. See, the government, based on the Sandhanam Committee recommendation, decided to establish an apex vigilance institution which is free of control from any executive authority. And this led to the creation of Central Vigilance Commission. Know that the Central Vigilance Commission does not come under any ministry and it is basically an independent body which is answerable or responsible only to the parliament. Now what is the role played by Central Vigilance Commission? See the Central Vigilance Commission monitors all vigilance activity under the central government. It also advises various authorities in central government organizations in their vigilant work. Then commission also receives complaints on corruption or misuse of office and recommends appropriate action. And you have to know that the Central Vigilance Commission is not an investigation agency. See, the investigation is either done through the CBI or through Chief Vigilance Officers in Government Offices. The Central Vigilance Commission looks into the offences committed by certain categories of Government Officers under the Prevention of Corruption Act 1988. The Commission is vested with the powers of superintendents over the CBI's functioning as far it relates to Prevention of Corruption Act 1988. And in general, it has a superintendence of vigilance administration in the central government and its organizations. In 2013, the parliament enacted the Lokpal and Lok Ayutaks Act 2013. This act has amended the Central Vigilance Commission Act 2003. After the amendment, the commission has been empowered to conduct preliminary inquiry and further investigation into complaints referred by the Lokpal. Then, as per Whistleblowers Act 2014, the Central Vigilance Commission can also receive complaints about corruption from whistleblowers. See, these are all some of the functions of Central Vigilance Commission. Now, moving on to see two restriction of Central Vigilance Commission. Now, look at this box here. See, these are all the people who are placed under Central Vigilance Commission's jurisdiction. Pass the video and go through it. In addition to these, the Commission's jurisdiction also includes any company where the cumulative share of the central government is at least 51% of the paid up share capital. From here, we can be clear that the Central Vigilance Commission does not deal with the matters pertaining to the state governments. This is about the role of Central Vigilance Commission. Now, let's see the appointment procedure of the Central Vigilance Commissioner in the Central Vigilance Commission. See, the appointment of Central Vigilance Commissioner and Vigilance Commissioners are as per the procedure laid down in Section 4 of the Central Vigilance Commission Act 2003. See, the persons to be appointed will be selected by a selection committee. It is chaired by Prime Minister. And other members of the selection committee are Union Minister of Home Affairs and Leader of Opposition in the Lok Sabha. See, after the recommendations of the selection committee, the Central Vigilance Commissioner and the Vigilance Commissioners will be appointed by the President by warrant under his or her hand and seal. Once the appointment is made, both Central Vigilance Commissioner and Vigilance Commissioners shall hold office for a term of 4 years or till they attain the age of 65 years, whichever is earlier. Note that a Vigilance Commissioner is eligible for appointment as a Central Vigilance Commissioner. However, the aggregate term of office in both posts shall not be more than 4 years. However, a Central Vigilance Commissioner is ineligible for reappointment. This provision is there mainly to ensure the service of the Central Vigilance Commissioner without fear or favour. Now, I hope this discussion helped you revise the important points regarding Central Vigilance Commission. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about Central Vigilance Commission. Then we saw about the role played by Central Vigilance Commission. And we saw about Central Vigilance Commission's jurisdiction. And finally, we saw about the appointment procedure of Central Vigilance Commissioner and the Vigilance Commissioners. Now, with these key points in mind, let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now, see this article here. 
the news is that a 22 year old woman in the state of karnataka was pushed into the banned devadasi system according to the policemen the woman had been ceremoniously married off to a deity at shri huligamma temple see the temple is located in huligi village which is in the koppal district of karnataka the police arrested the miscreants who pushed the girl into devadasi system and the miscreants are arrested under the provisions of karnataka devadasi's prohibition of dedication act 1982 and this is the crux of the news article given here now in this context let us learn about devadasi system before getting into discussion the syllabus relevant to this topic is given here you can go through it now first of all who is a devadasi see in india a devadasi was a female artist who was dedicated to the worship and service of a deity or a temple for the rest of her life the dedication took place in a ceremony which was somewhat similar to a marriage ceremony in addition to taking care of the temple and performing rituals these women also learned and practiced classical indian artistic traditions such as bharatanatyam mohiniyattam kuchipudi and odissi during festivals and other important days these devadasis performed dance performance within the premises of temples see they are all called as devadasis and such system is called devadasi system now let's see about the origin of this devadasi system see devadasi system originated in the period of early medieval india see this was also the period where temple administration in india was becoming complex initially devadasis who were tied to the temple were treated with utmost respect and reverence in earlier centuries of this practice devadasis were so esteemed that even some kings dedicated their daughters to temples but after a certain period their status was reduced to that of sacred concubines here concubine refers to a woman who lives with the man but has lower status than his wife or wives see devadasis were patroned by brahmins and other landed class members this ultimately led to the reduction in their social status here note one important fact devadasi system was more pronounced in southern part of india than the northern parts this is all about the origin and subsequent period of development of devadasi system in india now moving on to see the reasons why devadasi system is still prevalent in india the foremost reason is poverty see the families of girl children who are in extreme poverty in rural parts of southern india tend to donate their girl children to the temple thereby they grow up to become devadasis then another reason for prevalence of devadasi system still today is the cultural factor for instance in karnataka there is a traditional belief that when there is a famine drought or an epidemic then to appease gods and goddess a girl is dedicated to the local goddess huligamma in the case of andhra pradesh it is said that evil over the family or the village can be avoided by dedicating a girl in the family to the temple deity see these are all two main reasons why devadasi system is still prevalent in some parts of southern india now coming to the ways in which devadasi systems can be eradicated from india see various laws have been enacted in the past to stop the malpractice of devadasi system some of the laws which prohibits the practice of devadasi system enacted by various states are provided here just to go through it now from this we can say that there are laws already in place to prevent devadasi system but there is no stricter enforcement of these laws and to end this problem police forces should identify the areas where devadasi system was prevalent in earlier eras it should be followed with constant vigil on these identified areas and any incident reporter should be investigated thoroughly other than this awareness campaign which is showing the ill effects of devadasi system should be organized in the villages where there is prevalence of devadasi system here ngo can be roped in to help government officials to put an end to this inhuman practice see these are all some of the ways in which devadasi system can be eradicated from india and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we learned about what is devadasi system then why this system is still prevalent in india and finally about the ways in which devadasi system can be eradicated from india now with these key points in mind let's move on to the next news article discussion now look at this news article here it says that the chief minister of andhra pradesh has requested the prime minister to grant special category status to the state of andhra pradesh so in this context you should know about the special category states and what are all the benefits that a state would get if it is declared as a special category state firstly let's start with special category status 
see the constitution does not have any provision for categorization of any state as a special category status state so where did this come from see the concept was first introduced in 1969 in 1969 the fifth finance commission sought to provide certain disadvantaged states with preferential treatment in the form of central assistance and tax breaks and it was based on the gadgil formula and 11 states namely arunachal pradesh assam himachal pradesh jammu and kashmir manipur meghalaya mizoram nagaland sikkim tripura and uttarakhand were granted special category status this is a brief about special category status now we will see the parameters for special category status see there were five parameters and they are firstly hilly terrain then secondly low population density and or sizable share of tribal population thirdly strategic location along borders with the neighboring countries fourthly economic and infrastructure backwardness and finally non viable nature of state finances see based on these five parameters only the special category status was granted see this status was granted in the past by the national development council and it was later done by the central government then following the recommendation of 14th finance commission the special category status ceased to exist thereafter no new special category status has been granted to any state however in 2014 the central government has agreed to give a special assistance to the state of andhra pradesh based on the provisions of andhra pradesh reorganization act 2014 and this is to make up for the additional central share the state might have received during 2015 to 16 to 2019 to 20 here the funding of centrally sponsored schemes would have been shared at the ratio of 90 is to 10 between the center and the state of andhra pradesh here you should also know about the benefits to states with special category status see if a state is placed under the special category the center pays 90 percentage of the funds required in a centrally sponsored scheme to special category status states we know that normally 60% or 70% is provided in case of other states and the remaining funds are provided by the state governments but in case of special category status states the center pays 90% of the funds and the rest 10% alone will be provided by the state government this is the first benefit then the second benefit is that significant concessions are provided to these states in excise and customs duties income tax and corporate tax see these are all some of the benefits granted to special category status states and that's all regarding this news article see in this discussion we saw about what is special category status then what are all the states placed under special category status then we saw about five parameters based on which special category status is granted and finally we saw some of the benefits to the states with special category status now with these key points in mind let's move on to the next news article discussion see this article here it says that the maharashtra assembly passed the lok ayukta bill 2022 and it is said that this bill will bring the chief minister and the council of ministers under the ambit of anti corruption ombudsman and this is the crux of the news article given here now in this context let us understand about lok ayukta again see it will be revision for you know that it is the lokpal and lok ayuktas act 2013 that provided for the establishment of lok ayuktas but many states had already passed the laws before the 2013 act for creating the institution of ombudsman called lok ayukta we all know what is basis behind the creation of institutions like lok ayukta right the main objective of lok ayukta system in a state is to make investigation of grievances allegations against public servants the allegations mainly include corruption charges mal administration etc the major thing about the lok ayukta is that the lok ayukta structure does not follow a consistent pattern across all the states see some states have established both the lok ayukta and upa lok ayukta while some states only have lok ayukta so the establishment pattern is not consistent throughout the states now coming to the appointment of members of lok ayukta see the members are appointed by the governor of the respective state and while doing so the governor should consult with the chief justice of the state high court and the leader of opposition in the state legislative assembly in most states the term of office is fixed for a duration of 5 years or 65 years of age whichever is earlier and they are not eligible for reappointment for a second time 
so here the term is also not same for all the states and it varies state to state now coming to the powers of lok ayukta here also there is no uniformity regarding the jurisdiction of lok ayukta in all states the jurisdiction varies in relation to the inclusion of chief minister ministers higher civil servants members of state legislatures and authorities of local bodies corporations companies and societies in most states the lok ayukta can initiate investigations based on a complaint received from the citizens against unfair action or an suyamoto however in up himachal and assam the lok ayukta does not enjoy the power to start investigations on suyamoto in some states it considers cases of grievances as well as allegations but in other states it is confined to investigation of allegations alone and not the grievances like i said the powers differ in each states finally know that the lok ayukta presents report annually to the governor and the governor places this report along with an explanatory memorandum before the state legislature here note that the recommendations made by the lok ayukta are only advisory and not binding on the state government and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about lok ayukta then its objective then we saw about appointment of members and finally we saw about powers of lok ayukta and note one point here the powers and composition and appointment varies state to state and they are not uniform in all the states now with these key points in mind let's move on to the next news article discussion now look at this news article here it says that the tamil nadu government has notified the tamil nadu energy conservation building code rules 2022 the tamil nadu government also says that the buildings which do not utilize any energy or fossil fuel are exempted from the rules and this is the background of the news article given here now we will try to understand what is energy conservation building code see the energy conservation building code is basically a set of standards for minimum energy performance for commercial buildings here the energy performance standards include building envelope then heating ventilation and air conditioning then lighting then service water heating and electric power and distribution now you may wonder how we could conserve energy by building envelope see building envelope is nothing but building the wall and roof of the building see the code suggests measures like use of insulation materials that reduces heat absorption you have to know that energy could be easily and effortlessly saved if the building is constructed keeping that in mind let me give you an example if the building is properly ventilated for the sunlight to come in then there would be lesser lighting requirement during day so this is how the building code would influence the energy conservation now with this understanding we will learn more on the energy conservation building code see energy conservation building code was launched by ministry of power in may 2007 see this is a first step towards promoting energy efficiency in the building sector the ministry of power is implementing energy conservation building code in the states of india in consultation with bureau of energy efficiency here know that bureau of energy efficiency is functioning under ministry of power see the energy conservation building code was developed under the guidelines of bureau of energy efficiency with significant inputs from various other stakeholders such as practicing architects then consultants educational institutions and other government organizations now the purpose of energy conservation building code is to provide minimum requirements for energy efficiency design and construction of buildings and their systems without compromising on the comfort of occupants The code also provides present as well as futuristic advancements in building technology to cut down building energy consumption and promote low carbon growth. See now there are many conservation options coming in the market so the code acknowledges these emerging technologies as well. The code sets clear criteria for builders, designers and architects to integrate renewable energy sources in the building designs. In short, the Energy Conservation Building Code aims to achieve energy neutrality in commercial buildings. So what should you do to become Energy Conservation Building Code compliant? See to be Energy Conservation Building Code compliant, your building should be able to demonstrate minimum energy saving of 25%. Know that there are also categories to which you can move in if you are extra compliant. What I mean is energy savings of 35% and 50% will enable the buildings to achieve higher grades like energy conservation building code plus or super energy conservation building code status respectively okay 
that's all regarding this news article discussion this discussion we saw about energy conservation building code then about energy performance standards and finally about the purpose of energy conservation building code now with these key points in mind let's move on to the next part of the news article discussion that is to discuss preliminary practice questions now look at this first question this question is regarding nilgiri tar let's take up the first statement the nilgiri tar is placed under endangered category in the iucn red list see this statement is correct as we saw in the discussion it is placed under endangered category in the iucn red list so statement one is correct now coming to the second statement it comes under schedule 2 of wildlife protection act 1972 this statement is incorrect because nilgiri tar is placed under schedule 1 of the wildlife protection act 1972 and not schedule 2 so statement 2 is incorrect now coming to the third statement it is the state animal of kerala see this statement is also wrong because it is a state animal of tamil nadu now the question is asking for correct statement here statement 1 alone is correct so the correct answer is option a one only moving on let's take up the second question consider the following statements regarding the lokpal and lok ayukta act 2013 look at this first statement member of parliament and members of any legislature of state can be members of lokpal see this statement is incorrect because members of parliament and members of any legislature of state cannot be member of lokpal see i am going to list out the persons who all cannot be members or chairperson of lokpal make note of it see it include a member of parliament or a member of legislature of any state or union territory then a person convicted of any offense involving moral aptitude then a person of less than 45 years of age on the date of assuming office as a chairperson or member as the case may be then fourthly a member of any panchayat or municipality and fifthly a person who has been removed or dismissed from the service of a union or a state see these five categories of members are cannot be appointed as members or chairperson of the lokpal now look at the second statement members of panchayat and municipality cannot be members of lokpal as we discussed now this statement is correct members of panchayat and municipality cannot be members of lokpal now the question is asking for correct statement here statement 2 is alone correct so the correct answer for the question is option b 2 only moving on let's take up the third question which of the following were used as parameters to declare a state as a special category state first statement hilly terrain second statement high population density third statement strategic location along borders with neighboring countries fourth statement economic and infrastructure backwardness and fifth statement income distance see as we discussed second and fifth statement is incorrect because high population density is not a parameter to declare a state as special category state also the income distance was not taken into account to declare a state as special category state so first third and fourth statement alone is correct here the question is asking us to choose the correct option so the correct answer for the question is option a 1 3 and 4 only moving on let's take up the final question here the question is regarding bureau of energy efficiency now look at this first statement it was established in accordance with energy conservation act 2001 see this statement is correct the bureau of energy efficiency was established by the central government in accordance with energy conservation act 2001 so statement 1 is correct now coming to the second statement it functions under the ministry of power see this statement is also correct bureau of energy efficiency is functioning under the ministry of power so both statements are correct here the question is asking for correct statements so the answer for the question is option c both 1 and 2 and this is the quiz question for you today i will pose this quiz question in a community section try to answer it and displayed here are the main questions for your practice go through the questions write your answers and post it in the comment section with this we came to the end of the video if you like our analysis please like comment and share and don't forget to subscribe to shankar ai's academy youtube channel thank you for listening